So health and biotech news a tech bro or sis would find interesting. We're all bringing some stories from the week. On today's docket, we've got miracle weight loss drugs approved by the FDA and NICE. Are they too good to be true? A new non-alcoholic drink that promises all the benefits of alcohol without the hangovers. Is that too good to be true? And health tech, health tech everywhere, but where are the huge UK exits? Quick intros for everyone. So we've got Adam, the Jordanian juggernaut, is back to bless us with the worst possible takes on every issue imaginable. Although this week he didn't actually get time to prepare, so we're bound to hit some new lows. He's a longevity <laughs> doctor, co-founder of Span Health, which was acquired by Eight Sleep, and C-List famous on Instagram. Welcome, Adam. So I, I need to add this to my uh, to my bio. I was named one of the most impressive health entrepreneurs in the UK. <laughs> Now, granted, there were 99 other people on the list, but I was there. <laughs> How many health uh, entrepreneurs are there in the UK? Probably like 101. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and then we have Imran, the Pakistani prince, professor, and philanthropist. He is an Oxford-trained doctor, ex-McKinsey, and co-founded healthcare data company Nye Health. And when he's not self-promoting on YouTube, Substack, and just about every social network that exists... He gets some time to work as a consultant and invest. And I am Musti. I'm a doctor and maker of big picture medicine. Imran, do you want to start with the weight loss story? Yeah. So, so the big news um, at the moment, at least here in the UK, is on the heels of the FDA approval for semaglutide. Nice. The UK regulator has approved it uh, for use in weight loss, and will fund it. The government will fund this innovative weight loss drug for patients in the UK. There are some specifics around. Yeah, the eligibility around your BMI and having comorbidities. I won't go into that. But this is a real uh, turning point because for a long, long time, we have not had good, effective, safe, tolerable drugs that uh, provide sustained weight loss. Semaglutide, if you look at the trials, I think it was called a step one trial. It um, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. You can see these patients are losing 14, 15, 16% of their, of their weight in the first six to 12 months of taking this drug. Nothing has in the past ever really come close to that, at least pharmacologically. There's an absolute epidemic of obesity in our societies. In the UK, it's about 30%. In the US, overweight and obesity is 40% plus. In the GCC, it's even higher. So this drug is gonna affect millions and millions of people. It's gonna transform their lives. I think we are now at a stage where we look at obesity as a disease, as a heritable disease, either genetically heritable or through your socioeconomic status or whatever else it may be. And we finally have a proper effective treatment, which is reasonably safe, that'll be available to millions of people. Adam, can you talk about your experience as being a longevity doctor, taking patients in and taking them through this journey? Because my experience is that in the past, when you have a patient who's on a downward trajectory, they're overweight, they're going to have a heart attack or stroke, and you give them the advice, you know, you need to lose weight, you might put them on a course, but both of you know that it's probably not going to make a difference. And for the first time, we have something that is shown to work. Like, what's your take on all of this? Yeah, what many people don't understand is that genetics play a huge role in obesity. Now, we know that obesity has increased over the last few decades, um, but our genetics haven't changed. Why is that? It's because um, a huge part of obesity is genetic predisposition. So there's a, a certain percentage of people who are genetically predisposed to be obese in a modern environment of uh, abundance of hyper palatable food. These types of people find it very difficult to uh, maintain normal weights. Um, and things like uh, semaglutide are, as, as Imran said, we, we haven't had a drug like this before. And I'm getting loads of questions from patients about this drug. Now, the uh, questions that I get are, first of all, um, is it safe? Second of all, how fast will I lose weight? And third is, when I'm off it, will I just regain all the weight? Do I have to stay on it uh, for the rest of my life? Um, there's a few statistics from that uh, from the study, Imran. Do you want to read them out? I can throw up the, the key chart from the step one study here on the screen. You can see here that patients that had placebo and like lifestyle intervention, they just lost a couple of percent. But the semaglutide population lost about 10% of body mass in the first six months. And then it continued to trend down. So they got like another four to 6% over the following six months. Now, uh, studies also show, unfortunately, when you stop taking the drug, some of the weight comes back. Not all of it, but it looks like about half to two thirds or so can actually uh, be put back on by the patients. 
which is why I think in the NICE guidance and the um, this probably we'll see a similar thing from other regulators is the emphasis on lifestyle change to create that sustainable weight loss um, so that we don't have a situation where people are basically just dependent on the drug to keep their weight down. But this is, I mean, in comparison to other weight loss strategies, this is always the case. It, it's always the yeah. case where when you lose a certain uh, amount of weight, you're, it's super difficult to not reward yourself. Uh, you feel like you have some mileage. You, you feel like you can you can gain some more back. And one of the other important fact is that um, in the study, people didn't go back to baseline. They went back up, uh, as you said, 50 to uh, uh, 70%. So that's actually quite significant. And it also reinforces the educational aspect, the coaching aspect. And now that we know that people w should expect to regain weight, that we can incorporate that into uh, the coaching yeah. uh, side of things. When you're, when you're preparing someone to get off the drug, you can coach them you can emphasize that point to, to prevent that um, large increase. Yeah, and I think what, what, um, one of the things I, I, I personally believe is that, um, and if, if anyone wants to read more about this topic, I strongly recommend The Obesity Code by, by Dr. Jason Fung. I read that book about a year ago, really opened my eyes to a lot of the research and how... Oh, I, so I, 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 don't, you know? I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> he is so full of crap. No, but the, okay. Don't read The okay. Obesity Code. Don't read The Obesity Code, okay. Well, I found it, I found it useful. Um, I found it helpful. And um, Adam's got a book on obesity coming out next month, uh, self-published. Of course, you can <laughs> buy it on Gumroad for £9.99. Uh, link, link at the bottom. Um, so, uh, now, so now that I've got that out of the way... Let, let, me, let me get your thoughts on this philosophical argument against semaglutide, where people say, stop medicalizing this issue. You need to just get your life together, get your act together, start exercising, start eating healthier... And we don't have a pill for everything. You need to actually make some modifications, and that's going to have a huge kind of net knock-on effect on the rest of your life as well. So, what? Like, I mean, what are your responses to that kind of criticism that people are putting forward? I mean, that works for a certain type of people, but in the real world, there's a large percentage of people who know all of this but still struggle to keep a healthy weight. So, knowing that, and knowing that we've been trying this for decades now. Um, What's the solution? If we have a pill that can can help people maintain a normal weight, it's not a solution for everyone, but it can be really helpful for a large percentage of, of uh, the population. I, I'm I'm be, I'm bullish on um, pharmacology. I know it's controversial for an MD to be to be pushing uh, for more pharmaceuticals, but uh, it's not because I'm a pharma shill or anything. I I understand the limits of pharmacology. But I also understand the limits of lifestyle. I mean, understand the limits of, uh, of of human will and motivation. I have two. I have two comments I want to make here, Musty. The first is about just to build on what Adam has said. There are very real feedback cycles in the life of obese people that make it hard to break out of obesity. And so, a drug like this can actually help people to just break out of the pit of obesity they can't deal with. For example, think about all the musculoskeletal consequences of obesity and how they just make it harder to exercise. You know, if you have like chronic knee pain, joint pain, back pain, it's just gonna be harder for you to get that weight off. If you get a bit of help losing the weight with something like Wigovi, then that might be the thing that catalyzes your journey. The second thing is around like um, societal responsibility. So unfortunately in many societies, you have a kind of socioeconomic gradient when it comes to these types of conditions like obesity. So if people who are generally in the lower socioeconomic classes will have higher incidence of obesity and other chronic diseases. And I think this is ultimately comes kind of down to politics, but I think it's really heartening to see the government footing the bill to treat people and to help them with what is in some cases, or in many cases, part of the consequence of living in a food desert uh, in an environment that has like uh, less access to good physical uh, education, health education, uh, resources, facilities to exercise, safe built environments and so on. So I think that that's another aspect to it around, you know, the government taking some responsibility, footing the bill, um, and why this particular reimbursement decision is so important. Yeah, let's, let's just touch on the financials a bit, because we're finding from the step one extension trial that basically, if you stop taking this drug, you will basically put right. weight back on, or you will put most of the weight back on. So are people just going to be expected to pay for this forever? Like, what's going on? So, so the moment, the NICE approval is limited to two years. Now, everybody knows that inevitably, if you stop taking the drug after two years, as we discussed, you're going to gain weight again. The reason this is happening, and we see this a lot in pharmaceutical market access and pricing negotiations, is that where there's a very, very expensive drug, the government has like a fiduciary responsibility 
to constrain the economic impact of a decision whilst also making sure that people actually get access to the drug. So the two year period here is a way of capping how much money will be spent on paying for these drugs, paying the suppliers. And I'm absolutely certain, although I have no insider information, um, I'm pretty certain what will be happening is there'll be a bunch of data that's being gathered on how well this is working in the real world, on side effects, tolerability, how many patients are actually making it to two years. And then there'll be a review of that decision later. I'm sure the price will come down again. We don't know how much it costs, but in the UK at the moment, I think a Zempic is about £75 or $100 a month. So $25 a week. That's the price that's been negotiated. For Wigovi, it's probably higher, I would guess. We don't know what that is. And Adam, do you want to touch a little bit on the startup environment as well? Because we saw that when these trials started coming through, an explosion in startups that basically do direct-to-consumer supply of these drugs. Are they now dead in the water, at least in the UK or in markets where the government's going to fund them? I mean, my initial thought was that they're going to be affected negatively. But um, just working with the, with, with the, in the NHS, you'd know that... Um, the waiting times are probably going to be long. Uh, the types of people that will be targeted through NHS-sponsored weight loss programs are probably not the types of people who would have buy, uh, bought this stuff online anyway. So the NHS will probably ta take part of the market share and will affect um, these co the startups uh, a little bit, but there probably will still be uh, enough for everyone. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what's going to happen, I'll tell you why I think it's going to happen here. So the numbers that I've seen um, have suggested 35,000 people initially eligible under the NHS approval, right? If you assume that obesity is at 30% of the UK population, that's about 20 million people, right? Even if only 10% of them are willing to pay out of pocket to get this treatment, that's 2 million people. So 35,000 is like, it's not even scratching the surface. So this approval is, is good news, but the uptake is, you know, the target NHS patient group is going to be small and it's probably going to take quite a while for them to get access just because of the backlogs in all of the like clinical services that we're seeing. The real problem I think here will be, can you get enough supply? I don't know what the current supply situation is, but there have been stockouts in markets that have been approved um, like the US before the UK, lots and lots of stockouts. And I know that, you know, the manufacturers, if you think how much money they're losing, millions of dollars a day in revenue, they're scrambling to get more supply facilities up and online. So I think the real problem here is going to actually be supply at the manufacturer level and it's kind of corporate crisis for the companies that are making these drugs that are just, you know, selling them into an ever expanding market where people just can't get enough of them. So I don't think the supply thing is going to be an issue for a long time. I mean, it's very clear now that the demand for these uh, drugs is going to be is going to be high in the future. So I'm sure the, the supply side will catch up very soon um, and the, the economic incentive is there. I don't think we have confidence that the supply issues have been resolved. And I think one of the challenges that you'll get in the private market is wherever there's a mismatch between supply and demand, you'll see prices go up. So I think there's always going to be like a marginal um, customer that's willing to pay more for the next injection pen of Wegovy, uh, either on Harley Street or online or wherever it may be. And that price is just going to creep up. Yeah, and, and uh, my point was that uh, there's a, a use case for off-label use of Ozempic that will be covered by the private markets as well. Uh, so people who don't fall into the strict criteria of the NHS will probably get access to these medications uh, in the private sector. The other thing I wanted to just quickly touch on was just the viral marketing of semaglutide. I think we all probably came across it on Twitter first. Uh, yeah. It's been all over TikTok as well. My question is, do you think, and maybe this is tinfoil hat stuff, but do you think there's like guerrilla marketing agencies that pharma employ and they're just like, look, we've got this amazing drug coming out and just get it out into the world? Or do you think this is something that organically gets picked up? I have I have strong feelings about this. I've worked in the pharma industry for, for almost a decade with the pharma industry in various capacities. And I'm absolutely certain that that's not the case. I think that the value, the scientific value of this drug and the charts from the step one trial have been enough to trigger an avalanche of interest across social media, uh, mainstream media, and so on. Uh, I don't think they need to do that. I think their focus is squarely on innovating, creating better drugs. Uh, and everything else will generally take care of itself. Not in all cases. So I, I agree, uh, but I also disagree a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure, they don't do that on the pharmaceutical manufacturer level, but I think there is a lot of marketing from the distributor level. Uh, if I'm a startup and I'm uh, selling Zempic uh, subscriptions, then I'm probably interested in, in marketing my own startup in that way. Very good point. Um, do you guys have anything else to say on that or should we move on? 
Let's move on. Okay, so my story this week is there's a new alcohol which has all the benefits of alcohol, but without any of the drawbacks or the hangovers. Um, it's made by a guy called Professor David Nutt, who I want to just touch on quickly because I've met him before. He looks like a mix of Santa Claus and a kind of mad professor. And he's really kind of gregarious and he's got this kind of bombastic personality. So the interesting bit about him was that he was the former UK government's drug czar. And then he got spectacularly kicked out of government in, you know, on all the TV shows and things. Essentially, he made the point, and this was what was shown in the media, that horse riding is more dangerous than taking ecstasy, which... To be fair, statistically, it is. So if you look at, you know, per exposure to horse riding and per exposure to taking ecstasy, the statistics tell you that actually horse riding is more dangerous because horse riding is actually, even though it's really popular kind of in the UK and and elsewhere, uh, it's super dangerous. But anyway, he got kicked out for saying that. So he's got this like huge background of knowing how to play the media. He knows how to make a statement. And for the past, I think, almost decade, he's been working on this alcohol replacement. And the way that works is, is that it's a GABA agonist. So GABA is the receptor that alcohol affects, which causes the beneficial effects of increased socialization, gives you that buzz. Um, But it specifically targets that and doesn't cause any of the other downsides like to the liver, the brain and everywhere else. So what do you guys think of this? Why, Why do you think he's doing that? I think there's been a trend in Gen Z of stuff that harms you is just less cool. Uh, there's this really good Wall Street Journal article, which I'll link. But basically, it talks about how Gen Z, so that's people born in the late 90s to now, they're using less alcohol, less drugs, having less sex, less of them drive as well. So even though I think generations like now always think that, oh, the new generation is so wild, they're like, they're so messed up. Actually, I think people are just becoming more sensible and people are realizing that binge drinking it's it's not that cool. Like it's cooler to like you know do stuff that will benefit your lives. So I think it's, he's. It's not like just a Gen Z thing. Uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, who is one of the founders of um, A Sixteen Z, he wrote an article about quitting alcohol. And yeah, the reason why he quit alcohol was uh, after listening to Andrew Huberman's podcast on alcohol. Um, Andrew Huberman talked about basically the optimal amount of alcohol uh, is zero for health. And this is something I've been talking about for a long time. There's this, there was this notion that, so if you look at observa- observational data, uh, you see a J-shaped curve when it comes to alcohol consumption and uh, mortality rates. Uh, so th- what that means is a small amount of alcohol is associated with uh, less mortality than no alcohol at all, right? And then the mortality rate goes up again with uh, more uh, alcohol intake. Um, so the assumption there was that a small amount of alcohol is beneficial. But when you reanalyze the data, and people have done this, you can see that it's actually a reverse causality. So uh, people who don't drink alcohol at all, or people who are very sick, don't uh, can't afford to drink any alcohol. So that's why you see that correlation between zero alcohol intake and um, uh, higher mortality rates. Yeah, so what you're referring to is that in the media, there were all these articles saying that red wine is good for you, a little bit of alcohol is okay. But actually, that was based on a false inference from observational data that basically people who have no alcohol actually show worse mortality than people who have a little bit of alcohol. And actually, it just turns out that people who are having no alcohol, a lot of the times is because they can't afford it or they're sick or whatever. So Yeah, that's why people now are looking for alternatives. Now, I don't know about the alternative that you, you mentioned. Uh, and I don't know what the, where it is. Has it been tested? Do we actually know that it doesn't have any side effects? Um, and more importantly, is it halal? <laughs> <laughs> That's the most important question. Adam, your your Instagram just got cancelled. <laughs> um, look, so it's called Sentia Spirits. It's pitched as a food um additive i think and on the faq on the website under can you drive and take this it's it it says you can so i'm not entirely sure i don't know there's not much on the website in terms of data they don't have the halal certification so i'm assuming it's not halal but um i think it's very very cool i mean religious issues aside would you guys take this i think so i think that i'm i'm just going to make a uh generalization here that i think a lot of the relationship that societies have with alcohol is largely like legacy. Uh, it's to do with, you know, social behavior 
and societal behavior over long periods of time and how these things become ingrained. Um, so if this is an opportunity to reduce some of the harm and keep some of the benefits, protect more people, I mean, all you have to do is look at some of the statistics of how alcohol is a kind of public health scourge. Um, I think that, you know, it's hard to say no. Um, if we can reduce, you know, all of the chronic liver disease, all of the societal implications, domestic implications, absolutely. And just to give the other side of the coin, there's a really good book I recommend reading called Drunk, How We Sipped, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization by Edward Singerland. But it documents the whole history of alcohol. And I think the positive case it makes for alcohol, just to give the other side, is that actually it's been extremely important in history in terms of getting warring tribes, just getting you to get on with everyone, socialize, and build civilization as we see it today. It, it's in potentially enhanced creativity as well. And I think there's a point that if something has been there for so long and in so many kind of, in quote, successful societies, um, there must be some positives of it as well. So just to give the kind of non-halal take on alcohol, there are some uh, benefits of it as well. Uh, yeah, it is, it is a, a social lubricant. Yeah, absolutely. So I thought this was quite interesting, Imran, you mentioned this point, but if you chart out all the huge health exits in Europe, there haven't been any big ones coming out of the UK. So we have some, I think we have some health tech unicorns. So we've got Babylon Health, Oxford Nanopore, uh, CMR Surgical. There's a few like that, but there's been no big publicly disclosed exits. And the reason that's strange is because um, I'm a big kind of proponent of British exceptionalism. Um, the UK it makes up less than 1% of the world's population, but about 13% of the world's medical science uh, research is coming out of us. We're just behind US and China, actually. So I think we've got the perfect kind of primordial soup to be having loads of big exits. So why is that not the case? Yeah, so I'm I'm actually I'm actually not sure as well what the specific answer is here. But um, just to get some definitions out there, I think I would differentiate between health tech, which is basically digital health or technology, uh, which enables the delivery of healthcare services like tech enabled services, remote monitoring and so on, and med tech, which is basically devices and in some cases, you know, deep tech like the surgical robotic companies that you mentioned or the genetic sequencing company. So I think there's an important distinction to be made. I think when it comes to like academic research being spun out of the UK, we definitely have a really strong track record of taking groundbreaking public or grant funded or university funded research and turning it into companies. Nanopore is a great example. You talked about CMR, there's a whole host of them. When it comes to digital health, um, unfortunately, you know, even some of the cases you mentioned, like Babylon, have kind of been to unicorn status and unfortunately kind of come back again. Um, and we don't have a track record of like well-disclosed unicorn digital health exits. If you pull this chart up, it's from uh, 2021. It's a Speed Invest chart. They're a VC fund based in London. Um, you can see here that there's tons of exits. Most of them are undisclosed, which I think is usually a sign that um, the disclosure would raise eyebrows uh, or uh, sometimes there can be other reasons for that. But if they were big, like slam dunk exits, and I think they would have a lot more of these being disclosed. There's a few over a hundred million, but there's lots in the kind of, you know, 10 to 50 million mark. I think it's a function partly of our healthcare system, the absolute size of the system and the proportion of that funding, which is actually dedicated to funding technology and tech enabled services. It's not a talent problem. It's not even, I think, an availability of capital problem now because we do have lots of dedicated healthcare investors in the UK and Europe who are investing in UK companies, but also in US companies and seeing much bigger returns. Uh, the companies that get big in the US get a lot bigger. And even Babylon, I think a lot of their revenue and value inflection initially came from the United States. And then obviously they listed there through a SPAC. So I think it's a kind of market problem. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's going to put a lot of ambitious health tech founders off. I think it's an interesting question to look at, like, if we were going to have a huge unicorn in the UK healthcare system that's a genuine digital health company, where is it going to emerge in the healthcare system? What problem will it solve? What will it look like? My take on this is, so my uh, my experience going through a few rounds of funding in the UK, so our early rounds were mostly UK-led, and then our later rounds were uh, US investor-led. And so I saw a, a big difference between the mentality of UK and US investors. UK investors were more likely to to think in terms of relatively non-ambitious um, or unambitious exits. So they would think about uh, how will you exit to a bigger player in the U in the US, for example. 
rather than how will you expand to the US and how will you like um, become the biggest player in this space. Whereas US investors didn't think in that way. They didn't think in terms of um, being acquired by uh, a bigger player. They were always taking it to the next level and being the biggest player in the space. Um, so from a, that's from a mentality perspective. But I think there is an issue of just because there's a, a difference between the system in the UK and the US. In order to, to make it big, you need to expand beyond the UK and you need to solve uh, problems that are US uh, system problems. Um, and just by the fact that this system is so different here, uh, entrepreneurs here don't have an advantage uh, in that yeah. uh, in solving problems that are US centric. Just to build on that point, I think on talent, I think if you look at a lot of the successful healthcare companies that get to hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and unicorn valuations in the US, they're drawing on talent, not just from healthcare as an industry. And in healthcare in the US, you have actually many more large scale technology software providers where you will have ranks of senior executives in commercial roles, uh, in leadership roles that will seed the next generation of startup companies that have the same ambitions to become unicorns, decacorns. In the UK, we just don't have that. We don't have a legacy of like multi-billion pound market cap, healthcare technology, healthcare services companies, you know, numerous ones with senior executives that are ready to seed leadership roles in these smaller companies and take them to the same level. We don't even have that outside healthcare technology. It's very, very thin. Many of our like key technology assets in the last few years have been acquired by international players. Uh, I think Arm was a relatively recent example. So we have this, you know, overdeveloped financial services system and relatively much underdeveloped uh, when it comes to like enterprise software uh, technology companies. And so you, it's really difficult to find the depth of talent there of people who have done five to 10 years in these huge companies, grown them from 5 million to 50 million to 500 million of revenue. Is there enough space in the UK for a venture backed digital health startup? Like, is there, is there just enough room? Uh, there's often this quote about the NHS is where startups go to die. Um, and I was just wondering, is it that kind of singular focus and that kind of um, specificity of the NHS, meaning that then, you know, the UK startup in health is always doomed because it's not going to generalize? And you know, do you know what I mean? Is, is there enough room? I don't think that there's enough room for a big uh, unicorn in the in the UK. You need to you need to think beyond the UK. And the problem is. Um, some people think beyond the UK, as in going into Europe, Europe has even worse problems than the UK um, when it comes to healthcare systems. So uh, in order for a startup to be super ambitious, you need to go to the US. Is one solution to this to just build a D2C digital health startup? That's kind of what you did, right? Yeah, I mean, on this point, uh, an interesting statistic is that uh, we so basically we could take users from all around uh, from all around the world our subscription price was a bit high it was 149 dollars a month right so it was a premium subscription so the, the way our funnel would go is you could book a call and on the call we would upsell you the subscription and um, so we stopped taking calls from anyone outside the us at, at one point just because the even even the uk uh, just because the lifetime value of the US uh, customer was uh, was so much higher than everyone else, everywhere else. It wasn't worth our time taking calls from anywhere else. Even the UK, people would subscribe for one month or two months and then they would churn. So the, there is a consumer problem as well. Uh, people in the UK are, uh, are just not used to like, paying out of pocket for private healthcare uh, products. So if I, I think if we, if we look at this question in a different way, which is like, if you were going to build a healthcare unicorn in the UK, like what, what would it need to look like? And people have said a lot in the past about, you know, building commercial services off the back of NHS medical data. I think um, we haven't yet seen really huge companies that are doing that well. Um, we do have a great data asset. You've got multi-generational digitized medical records from birth to death for basically most, if not all the population. So it's, it's interesting, obviously implementation challenges there aside. A lot of our spend in the UK is actually on staff, right? So we spend a huge amount of our uh, of our annual budget on workforce. If I take an example of primary care, um, which is one of the you know huge news stories of this year in terms of the waits and delays and backlogs, I think somewhere around three quarters of the of the spend of a primary care practice or more is actually on staff. So I think products and services that significantly increase productivity in healthcare by taking the tasks that are normally backlogging your staff and begin to automate them 
and deliver them, you know, at zero marginal cost because it's done basically by robots, by software. Those types of companies, I think, can potentially have a big difference, but can potentially make a big impact. I mean, let's just let's just be honest. There's there's too much bloat. There's too many middle managers who don't actually do anything in the NHS who are <laughs> causing all this bloat. Do we need like uh, ten? Uh, uh, I don't know, like um, equity officers <laughs> in every hospital. Like, yeah, I, I don't, let's be honest. Oh, I most don't of these know. people I, can be outsourced to Chat GPT. No, I, I don't know about that. I'm thinking, I'm thinking more about um, just potentiating or amplifying the impact of a clinical worker or an administrative worker that's dealing with back office tasks like processing inbound communication, handling injuries into a medical record, processing appointments, all of that stuff. Um, or even some of the like more routine aspects of clinical care. So I think we'll begin we, to see that. We still use humans to 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 dictate letters. We still we still use humans to listen to transcribe <laughs> to to dictations and then type out physically a, a letter. Like that that shouldn't be a thing in the twenty first century. So um, I think D to C is a problem, as Adam said. I think the fact that everybody in this country has the expectation of care that's delivered free at the point of delivery, um, without any charge has basically set a baseline or precedent for clinical services, which is quite hard to break with any kind of D to C service, unless it's at the margins of people with lots of spare cash to spend on out-of-pocket payments. But I think that is a headwind for any company that's trying to go D to C. We are seeing some you know, breakout companies that are uh, providing services at the margins of what the NHS would provide. Everything that sits in the kind of therapy and um, additional, like not not necessarily clinical, but additional support around major life events, transitions, menopause, um, childbirth, pregnancy, sleep, um, a so psychological well-being. We're seeing those types of companies that are increasingly selling by employers. Um, but there are a few examples now of companies that have reached scale doing that in the UK. I'm not sure what the next frontier will be. One thing I think that's very interesting is around elderly care. This is one part of the healthcare system which is still largely funded out of pocket, and um, especially if you have assets, you will have to pay for your own care as you age until you fall below a threshold. So there are companies that are um, building, you know, services where they're delivering elderly care or they're enabling the financing or they're selling support for carers through employers to enable people that are working in what we call the sandwich generation because for the first time we have people who have children and who have parents that are living longer and longer and they're sort of sandwiched in between. And that can be a very stressful place to be. So I think there are services that will emerge to support those people financially, emotionally, psychologically, and practically. Wait, Imran, let me ask you a question because I've got a lot of friends in this space who are about to build interesting things or building interesting things. Um, I've yet to have an idea myself. But a problem that I think from their perspective I see is if I have this great idea that can in whatever way improve health productivity, why would I build it in the UK at the mercy of, I think it's called a monopsony, right? But there's like a single um, kind of like a monopoly where there's just like the NHS, like that's like the provider you're selling to. Um, why would I build it here? And then I grow it and then I don't potentially have the scale to justify a venture backed startup. And then I need to move to the US anyway. Like, so why would I, I've seen like a couple of friends just think like, why not just go straight to the US to start with? Like, why? Why have this initial step with the UK? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, what yeah, are the incentives? I think I think that um, uh, it's reasonable to develop a service where you're learning how to build a good product in a local market with a direct-to-consumer offering. I think that's a reasonable thing to do before scaling that service either to a bigger direct-to-consumer market like the US or taking it from D to C over to a B to B offering where you're selling eventually to consumers, to patients, but via health insurance plans or uh, via employers that are self-insuring. So I think there can be reasons around like intermediate steps where it's justifiable. If you're trying to just think very commercially about where am I going to build the biggest business, uh, you're likely not going to find it in the UK market. Unless, as I said, you go into one of these pockets where um, the NHS is, is not funding care in those segments. I think semaglutide is actually a classic example because it will not be able to cope with the numbers of people and the demand for some time. So that the caps of 35,000, uh, according to what I've read. Uh, but elderly care would be another example and all of the services that are sort of auxiliary around what the NHS sees as its own responsibility. Fine. Awesome. Um, anything else on that? Or shall we call it a day? Yeah, I need to go anyway. You need to go. Okay. Um, okay. Happy to stop there. We've got some content we can even use next time.